And I just, I, I really just, really just want to echo my wife's sentiments. Uh, thank you so much for all of your prayers, all of your support, all of the love over these last several weeks. It's really sustained us, and so I want to thank you. And it just goes to show the importance of spiritual community, of having a family of faith that during our difficult moments, um, we are carried by the prayers, the love and support of God's people. And I, I, I have something more to say about that in my message, but, but please understand, we can never underestimate that. So thank you so much. I'd like to continue this week. If you remember, I started a message last week, and I'd like to continue that. Uh, from the book of Ephesians. We're going to continue uh, talking about the armor of God this morning. And I'd like to read the passage in its entirety to put everything in its context. So, the word of God reads. And oh, by the way, I'm going to go back to verse 10. I'm going to read through verse 20. That will give us the entire context, okay? Here's what God's word says. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, ev in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The title of today's message is This Means War, Part 2. And I will be continuing the message that I started last week. We will discuss how God equips each of his people with the full armor of God. Let's take a moment to pray for today's message. My gracious Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus, and we're so thankful for the word. We're so thankful, Father, that you do not leave us defenseless. So, Lord, as we gather today... We pray that you would speak to us, that we would hear what it is that you have to say. And Lord, this is a critical word for this hour. So Lord, help us to lay hold of it, that we may see it at work in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. As I reflect on this scripture passage, it reminds me of a time during my days as a college undergraduate. I was going through a particularly difficult time in my walk with God. You might describe it as a wilderness experience. So I was driving to school one day, ascending a hill leading up to Chamberlain Avenue, and I can remember hearing vividly, almost audibly, a voice saying, I am going to make you a warrior. It was very striking and out of the ordinary. Allow me to say, that is not exactly what I wanted to hear that morning. As I looked into the horizon, 
I said in response, can I be a man of peace and wisdom like Solomon? <laughs> After all, who wants to be involved in fighting of any kind, let alone spiritual warfare? So I reflected on this for a bit. And then when I arrived at campus, I found a place to park so that I can have some devotional time before class. I pulled out my Bible and it fell open to Psalm 144, verse 1, which reads, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. <laughs> Mind you, I was not happy at this little confirmation. It's not exactly the word I was expecting, but to me, it was unmistakable confirmation that, like it or not, I had been enlisted in God's military. Now, I say this not because it's unique to me. The point I wish to make here is to reemphasize what I said last week. When you made a decision to follow Jesus, you engaged in an act of war. No matter how peace-loving you are, you chose sides in a cosmic spiritual battle. Allow me to quote Kent Hughes, who puts it in perspective and makes this point with a brilliant illustration. Most of us are probably aware of John Bunyan's work, The Pilgrim's Progress, brilliant allegory. You may not be aware, though, that among his other works was another allegory called The Holy War. At least that's how most people refer to it, The Holy War. Now, let me give you the full title of the work. It is The Holy War made by King Shaddai upon Diabolus for the regaining of the metropolis of the world or the losing and taking again of the town of Mansoul. How's that for a title? It was very typical at that time in the 17th century to lay it all out in the title, to tell the reader exactly what the book was about. And that title leaves no doubt in our minds what Bunyan was intending to say. He believed that God and Satan are locked in a titanic war in which the souls of humanity are at stake. That we are the principal players in a very real war. There is nothing of the anti-supernatural Nothing of flat-sided theology of today's avant-garde theologians in Bunyan. Rather, this is honest-to-goodness, full-blooded, biblical theology. That our struggle is not, as we read, against flesh and blood. Bunyan was using allegory to make a very important point that we as believers are engaged in a warfare. Often one that you may not see, you certainly may not see it with the eyes, but it's going on in the spiritual realm. Yes, you and I are warriors in a great spiritual battle as God's people, and we are engaged in conflict with the powers of darkness. However, don't let that discourage you or frighten you. As the scripture said, God will arm you for victory. He will equip you so that you can overcome your adversary, the devil. And he will teach you how to use what he has given you. Please be encouraged. God equips each believer for complete victory in our spiritual struggle. So how are you and I prepared to overcome our spiritual adversary? Well, God gives followers of Christ spiritual armor, as Paul said in this passage, that can withstand Satan's evil attacks. As we pointed out last week, God's word says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of spiritual souls. They equip the believer with spiritual weapons necessary to engage in spiritual battle and to overcome in that conflict.
let's take a look at the various elements that God uses to equip the believer. First of all, we are supported by the belt of truth. Let's look again at what Paul says. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now let's take a look at this for a second. I want to make here a point that I believe is very important. Our success in overcoming the powers of darkness lies in applying these truths and using these spiritual elements, the armor that's listed here, God's armor. As believers take up God's armor by applying these spiritual principles, they can gain victory over the enemy, over his wicked strategies and his evil power. Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority over all to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. This does not necessarily mean that Christians should make an advanced study of the hierarchy of evil beings. Paul's words are meant to instruct and impart needed knowledge that will make God's people vigilant while also instilling confidence in believers. The belt of truth, or the girdle of truth, is what held the various pieces of the armor together. It was something upon which the soldier could hang his weapons, almost, almost like a utility belt. Paul teaches believers to stand with the belt of truth, providing support for their core, girded with the confident knowledge of God and his truth. Remember, God's truth does not pass away. His truth will prevail against any lie. As Warren Wearsby points out, Satan is a liar. But the believer whose life is controlled by truth will defeat him. The girdle holds the other parts of the armor together. And truth is the integrating force uh, in the life of the victorious Christian. A man of integrity with a clear conscience can face the enemy without fear. However, since a discussion of truth and its power must include the Word of God, this also reminds us of the importance of equipping ourselves with a knowledge of God's Word. Some of the greatest warriors were also those who steeped themselves in the Word of God. Kent Hughes makes an important observation here. He writes, without clenching ourselves tightly, without cinching ourselves tightly with truth, the other weapons of our warfare will clatter in disarray. Those who have stood firm as great warriors for Christ have been men and women of the word, and so were filled with the eternal truth of Scripture. Now, this is not to be confused with what Paul says later about the sword of the Spirit. I'll explain the distinction. Nevertheless, as Maxie Dunham, Dunham summarizes for us, the imagery here is that truth holds together all the other virtues and makes them effectual. That leads to the next part of our spiritual armor. As believers, we are guarded by the breastplate of righteousness. We should also have that breastplate of righteousness protecting our hearts and our vital organs. When we put on the righteousness of Christ, we can stand firm, we can stand in firm confidence even when the enemy tries to condemn us. Maxie Dunham makes this point very well. He says, as the purpose of a breastplate is to guard the most vital parts of the body, so the Christians protects himself by righteousness. When persons are close to righteousness, they are impregnable. Notice what the Word of God says. For he, Jesus, made, no, for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yes, we are robed in Christ's righteousness. Even so, we have a responsibility to live lives that are characterized by righteousness, not necessarily perfection, 
as you and I apply the word of God to our lives as disciples should, we reflect God's righteousness by the way we live. This leads to the next part of the believer's armor. In Christ, we are fitted with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's look at verse 15. He says, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Likewise, we must have a readiness to advance the gospel as shoes adorn and protect our feet. Notice the gospel, the good news about Jesus, must travel and be taken to those who need to hear about the Lord and his wonderful gift about reconciliation through Christ. Notice what it says, Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Likewise, Paul makes reference to them when he, this when he says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So you see that the gospel needs feet. And those feet are very well shod. In fact, the bottom of those shoes, they were kind of like, the best way to describe them, kind of like half sandal, half boot. They were studded with hobnails on the bottom so that the soldier could stand firm in battle. According to Maxie Dunham, in the gospel, the believer is prepared for all difficulties. The gospel gives us the stability of sure footing. Likewise, he brings out the other side of this truth, specifically that we must be ready to carry the gospel any and everywhere. That leads to the next all-important part of the believer's armor. As Christians, we are protected by the shield of faith. Look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts or flaming arrows of the evil one. The word above all sets the shield of faith apart. Faith is the foundational element upon which our spiritual life rests. As the scriptures have said repeatedly, the just shall live by faith. So for the believer, faith is a way of life. It means that our knowledge of God inspires our trust, even when we do not fully understand something. It means we hold fast to who he is and what he says, even when our circumstances and feelings tempt us to doubt. Satan will target you then. He understands when you're vulnerable. He understands when doubts are tormenting your mind or when you have questions. And that's when the arrows come. And they're not just ordinary arrows, they're flaming arrows. They were dipped in pitch. They were tar or pitch and set, uh, and, and set on fire. So that this way, they struck their target. They would burn um, and, and the fire would spread. And so it would do incredible damage. And that's what the lies of the enemy do if you don't lift the shield of faith. But you know, when those arrows come, you say, I know, I don't understand it all, but I know who is in charge of this. I know who's going to bring me through. And I know he's got an answer, even though I can't see it now. You lift the shield of faith, and it will quench the flaming arrows. The lies will not get through. They will not do their damage. I'm quoting Maxie Dunham yet again. He says, one of the most dangerous weapons of ancient warfare was that fiery dart. And I pretty much just said this, right? I pretty much uh, just, just said this. I'm really, really reading what, I'm, what I had just quoted you. The heads of the darts were, of arrows would be wrapped in flax or hemp fiber, soaked in pitch, set afire before they were thrown. Wooden shield would, would, could be set afire by them. For this reason, the shield was covered with a layer of hide and were large enough to protect the whole body. 
even though the dart may pierce the shield, the fire would be quenched. In fact, sometimes they would take that shield and they would soak it in water. And so this way, even when the arrow struck, just fire couldn't spread. Faith will protect us from all of Satan's lies and evil devices. They are like those flaming arrows. So when they hit their mark, they not only wound, they burn as well. They cause, listen, when you believe a lie, it causes incredible damage. I mean, it's not even true, but it causes damage as if it was. When that lie penetrates, when it strikes, it hits its mark, then even though it is not true, it can do irreparable harm. Thank God. That's why he says, above all, take the shield of faith. The shield was about two, maybe two and a half feet wide. Now it's about four feet tall. It was made of wood covered with cloth or leather. The design of the shield allowed for soldiers to interlock them, creating a solid wall that would allow them to advance against the enemy. I'll have more to say about this later. But for now, let's take a look at the next piece of the believer's armor. The Christian is covered with the helmet of salvation. Verse 17 says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation provides protection for the mind, a covering for the mind, protecting us from the destructive thoughts that undermine faith and create strongholds that could cripple the believer. As those whom Christ has saved, redeemed, and given and are given new life in him, believers can adopt a new way of thinking that aligns their thoughts and their faith with kingdom paradigms and priorities rather than worldly patterns. Look at what the word of God says. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among whom, also, among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That's why we must counteract the worldly ways of thinking with the helmet of salvation. Word of God says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We're not to set our minds on earthly things. He says set your minds on things above, not on the things of this earth. And believers who are in the spirit and discerning between spiritual things and carnal things, worldly mindsets to this world, we are able, we can have the mind of Christ. That brings us to the next crucial part of our spiritual armor, which the believer is, the believer in Christ is armed with the word of God. Remember what verse 17 said, and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God's servants must arm themselves with the word of God, and the word describes it as the sword of of the Spirit. Certainly the Lord Jesus used the Scriptures skillfully when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Because the Word of God is spiritual and it is truth, it has unparalleled spiritual power. In our struggle against evil and corrupt deceptive world thinking, our most effective, our most effective response remains, it is written. Allow me to make a distinction here. Because we have the belt of truth. And we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to explain something. When he says the, the Greek word that he uses here for word is not logos. It is rhema. 
which refers to the spoken word. Specifically, now I'm going to give it to you in my own words. Specifically, it is the appropriate word spoken into a given situation. Uh, Brother Cho calls it the saying word of God. Again, I'm going back to the Lord's example. He showed us how to effectively speak the word into situations to counteract Satan's lies. In other words, it's not just enough to know the word of God. You need to know how to use it in a given situation. That's why, remember the, the instruction that he gave Timothy, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, the servant of God, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, you need to know how to apply the word in a gifted situation. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Now, why was that important? Because when Jesus started quoting Scripture, Satan started quoting Scripture back at Jesus. Jesus was quoting Scripture, Satan was misquoting Scripture. And so Jesus turned around again and rightly divided the Word of God. And he counteracted Satan's lies. We must be skilled in the appropriate application of God's Word in a given situation. That's why we must be disciples who are trained by their Master. As Jesus said, Jesus, I'm quoting from John chapter, thir, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my, disi my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen. If you've been under my teaching for any length of time, you will notice I rarely quote verse 32 without quoting verse 31. Yes, the truth will make you free if you abide in God's word and you are his disciple. Very important distinction to make. You need to know how to appropriate the word of God in the right situation. Because our spiritual survival depends upon our skillful use of the scriptures, believers cannot afford to be casual about their interaction with the Bible. Because the Word of God is our only offensive weapon in the spiritual armor, believers should give priority to developing skills in, its, in using this aspect of our armor. Finally, it all comes together as each piece of the armor is empowered by various prayers. Let's take a look at what Paul says here. He says, praying always, interesting, with all all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is saying to us here that prayer has a strategic place in the believer's life in our struggle against evil. And notice he makes reference to different kinds of prayers. Supplication, thanksgiving, intercession. All of these things work together to empower the believer to make the armor of God effective. For this reason, effective prayer must have the Spirit's empowerment. Notice what he said, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So praying in the Spirit, having the Spirit's empowerment. We also cover one another from spiritual attack with our intercessory prayers. As we pray for one another, we develop the capacity to endure the hardships associated with spiritual warfare. As Paul requested 
for himself, we should especially pray for those who are in spiritual authority and who minister the word that they may be shielded from Satan's fierce attacks and that their preaching may have powerful spiritual impact. This underscores the importance of unity. Ultimately, we can only triumph if we fight together. And that means it is time for us to stand shoulder to shoulder and to lock shields. I want to go back to what I mentioned before about the shield of faith. In ancient times, the soldiers who went into battle were wearing their heavy armor. We all just described it piece by piece. And notice what Paul said. We are to take up the full armor of God. However, one of the things he said, remember I said, above all, above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, I described it to you before, about two, two and a half by four, and the shields were made in such a way that they could interlock. This, um, this was called the phalanx. What they would do is they would, the soldiers would all gather together, stand shoulder to shoulder, lock shields, and they would have their spears drawn. So this way, they created a wall that they could use to advance against the enemy. Now think about this for a second. You, armed with your spiritual armor, you are equipped to defend yourself against any and all of Satan's spiritual attacks. That's a comforting thought. But this is not just about defense. The way we advance is to lock shields. The only way forward, the only way forward is to lock, and, that, and that's where unity comes in. Hey, if, we, if it just was a matter of you and me being a bunch of individual soldiers trying to survive, that's one thing. But that's not what God is talking about. And that's where we need to take it to the next level. That's really important. That is an important lesson for us to learn. I remind you too, I think I was pretty thorough in describing what Paul here, Paul really gave a very, a very comprehensive list of the typical armor that, say, a Roman soldier would wear. All right, well, you know as well as I, there was only one part that was not protected. You tell me. That's right. Did you notice that there's nothing in the back? Because that means that we are supposed, we're not made to run. God did not, he did not equip us so that we could run. Those, those sandals or boots, those, those shoes, those hobnail shoes, they were not made for running, they were made for standing firm. So you and I, we need to face forward, we need to lock shields, and together we need to advance against the enemy. I'm going to invite you to stand with me, please.